Hi, I'm Jenny Thompson, Executive Director here at Dixon's, and today I am in the library of the wonderful Dixon City in Bradford. For several years, I lived and worked in Reg Amelia, a founding early years teacher in the first English language school to deploy the Regio approach. It was incredible, immersive training. It shaped my identity as much as it shaped my teaching. Central to the approach is an appreciation of the arts as foundational to child development and that children's artistic development, indeed their self-development, should value process over product. Early mark making being valued as generating dexterity and the ability to articulate intention into image rather than diminished as scribbles or set aside in favour of cutesy replicable crafts. The fridges of Reg Emilia are not peppered with paint by numbers. As an English teacher, this resonates. To learn to craft an exceptional GCSE essay, you do not start by asking students to write an essay. Of course, we define and isolate the skills, both concrete and exploratory, and then construct a curriculum that lasts years during which the isolated skills and knowledge will be built upon. The ability to craft sentences skillfully, to deploy ever more specific and sophisticated vocabulary, to deconstruct character and writer's intent, to select quotation to evidence the thesis, and then to communicate this thinking effectively to the reader. Moving from sentences into coherent paragraphs into thesis without bypassing accurate spelling, punctuation and grammar. Each element intelligently sequenced and threaded through with iterative opportunities to recall and refine understanding. Of course, we English teachers know we are not teaching them how to write essays at all, but how to think coherently and communicate this with others. The canonical knowledge is the right of all. It is the scribble that leads to the dexterity of independent thought. It was only because Picasso was so adept at the formal tradition that he was able to subvert this into such experimental spaces. Mastery in practice. But it is an easy shift to translate this to the academic curriculum. Where I think it has underexposed potential is in the culture curriculum. Generating the identity of a school is iterative and needs to be broken down into discrete skills and pieces of knowledge that can be built upon over years. And just as with effective teaching, teachers need to be able to articulate what specifically is being taught, how this is being assessed, and how both they and the child will know what success will look like. This is central to delivering on equality, diversity and inclusion at a level beyond the experiential moment. This is the practical application of purpose, not power. As Zaretta Hammond would put it, a lot of people will focus when we talk about cultural responsiveness only on anti-racism or social justice in the curriculum. They totally miss getting students ready for rigor. A critical anti-racism and social justice tool in our schools is delivering outcomes. We need to ensure that our academic curriculum is championing the values of equality, diversity and inclusion. But our teachers need to be so expert that they can translate this into accelerated progress for our children. And we need to be unashamed of what this will ask of our students. They are going to have to develop intrinsic motivation. We can begin with dependency, but we need to move them to independently able to do the work and critically independently determined to do the work. They need autonomy. This shifts the whole conversation away from who has power into do we know the purpose? So back to the English classroom. In the academic curriculum, we will work from modelled examples into co-constructed examples through to independently generated responses. 
that metaphorical hand can be held, but hold it for too long or move it away at the wrong time and the student's metaphorical pen will stop writing. This is the skill space between an excellent curriculum plan and expert teaching. Just so the culture curriculum, we need to explicitly make iterative opportunity for our students to move from modelled expectations of rigour that build readiness over time into their ability to enact this independently. And this must begin with our most vulnerable. We must front load the school experience to track a bright line through to adulthood, one grounded in self-determination with an appreciation of and ability to deliver on rigour. No child is able to make it through to adulthood without compassion, perhaps because of a specific need, perhaps because of a reckoning with their own identity or sexuality, perhaps because of circumstances far beyond their control, illness, bereavement, friendship breakdown. And each of these will be and will feel different for each child and the durations will alter. And some children will need compassion enduringly and they will all be deserving of it. A century ago, Paolo Freire summarised the dichotomised thinking that has come to colour this generation of teachers and leaders, saying education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity, or it becomes the practice of freedom. We are never going to reach consensus on how education ought to be iterated because fundamentally there is not consensus on what it is for. For those who see education as the root of social justice, where knowledge is power and the entitlement of all, the purpose of education is primarily to deliver accelerated progress resulting in significantly more facilitating outcomes where students can become able to shape their futures with choice and should they wish to, demand the injustices of society be challenged. Safeguarding, social interaction, kindness, character are in service to this end and critical to delivering it, but they are not the goal unto themselves. For those who work in areas of socioeconomic disadvantage, the hand wringing of well-meaning advocates for education being primarily about something other than delivering facilitating outcomes feels really rooted in privilege. Not doing well in your exams is a luxury of social advantage. The life of the dilettante, the Parisian garret, was the dream of the youth who knew their family estate was there to be returned to, to be inherited. Hunger is not romantic when it is a real possibility. As school leaders, not delivering accelerated progress that facilitates a future of choice for our students is intrinsically a tool of oppression. Knowledge is power and that power is the right of all. Know your purpose and you are handing over the power. And our most underserved need this the most. Our most vulnerable ought to be entitled to our most expert teaching and our most intelligently planned academic and cultural curriculum. Only in the rigour of great order can the minority become the focus. But an organisation needs to know what it thinks education is for in order to ensure that every element in its structure reinforces and moves the student towards this objective. Accelerated progress is stunted when a school is confused about its identity and moves in lots of directions, however well, all at once. The journey becomes vacillations rather than advancing. Incidentally, this can feel really, really busy, even exhausting. So it is hard to spot, but it is never advancing. To deny access to the knowledge of power in favour of adolescent access to momentary freedom is to do a sorry disservice to the future potential of our children. 
As such, education can become the instrument to give students the tools to choose integration, to bear witness to the logic of the present system with the facilitating outcomes that mean they can choose to challenge conformity and lead future iterations of freedom. Thank you for watching this episode. Please like and subscribe to Open Source at dixonsos.com.